you have tons of young men, especially those young men who are teens and going into young adulthood, who do not feel like they're able to manifest their masculinity in the real world. So what do they do? They go to make those connections and manifest their masculine virtue in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. That's why they play Call of Duties for eight hours. That's why they play you know, Skyrim for 10 hours. That's why they connect with their friends online. They have a sense of community, a sense of brotherhood, mission. They get to protect people who are in distress. Mm -hmm. All those masculine virtues that we pride ourselves as Catholic men are present right there in the industry and the industry is tapping into them. And that's why it's so attractive to all these young men. Hello and welcome to a discussion on video games and evangelization. I'm Bobby Angel, a fellow at the Word on Fire Institute, and with me is a priest and a friend, Father Blake Britton. He is a priest of the Diocese of Orlando. He is a contributor to Word on Fire, and he's an avid video game player. And that's <laughs> kind of where we bonded and, and um, forged a friendship over. So Father Blake, how are you doing? Doing very well, thank you. It's, it's interesting because Bob and I actually met in seminary many years ago. And uh, he discerned the married life, beautiful vocation. The Lord continued me on to priesthood. And uh, as you mentioned, one of our initial things that we bonded over in seminary was video game culture. Little did I know <laughs> that we'd be reconnecting all these years later to talk about the same topic and, and how it relates to evangelization and the mission of Word on Fire. So um, I'm just super excited to be here and I'm really looking forward to the series. I think it's gonna be outstanding. So we're actually doing a series of videos on video games and Catholicism, how that Christianity intersects with uh, video games as a phenomena, as a entertainment medium, their place in the culture, where there's truth, goodness, beauty, community, quest and purpose, adventure. We're going to have various uh, people in the industry on this show series. And but Father Blake, why should we even devote this amount of time talking about video games? Yeah, I think in the minds, especially some older people, so Baby Boomers, Gen X, you know, video games would be Pong, you know, the arcade days, what have you. But uh, in the past several decades, video game culture has really revolutionized. Um, and it's become the leading entertainment industry in the world, especially among younger generations, so millennials and Gen Z, um, who even prefer to play video games over going to the movies or things right. with their friends. I mean, this is the way that they connect with one another. Uh, and so for us as Catholics, especially with the mission of Word on Fire, uh, this is a, a major industry that right now is lacking a Christian presence and lacking sort of this uh, evangelical fervor and, and devotion. And even just deeper philosophical, theological conversation, although this is very much prevalent in video game culture, and we'll speak more about that in the upcoming series, especially as we bring in the, the various experts from the field, but this is an industry that has depth, that longs for deep conversations and for ways to relate with one another. And I think that we as the, as the Catholic Church can really help provide that with the longstanding intellectual tradition that we have. So I'm very excited about it. And once again, I think it's going to be an endeavor that bears a lot of fruit for the church. Can you talk a bit about the, the size of the industry right now? Yeah. Because it's not just a little corner of the entertainment market or this corner of people's lives that doesn't isn't really a part of the major population. According to the Entertainment Software Association in 2020, 75% of all U.S. households have at least one person who's playing video games, and the average age is actually between 35 and 44 years old. It's not the, the, the youngins. Certainly young people are playing video games, right. but they've grown up. Like we've right. grown up, we've continued playing them. So the majority of Americans right now are playing video games. That could be on a cell phone, that could be on a console, that could be on a PC. Right. It's right. not a small neg part of the the culture we should neglect. Right, no, most certainly. I mean, my uncle was just work, uh, working recently on a new stadium in Philadelphia. It's being built right next to the Philadelphia Eagles Stadium. It's called the Fusion Arena. This is going to be a, a stadium that focuses only on what we call esports or electronic sports, so video gaming. And literally thousands of people are gonna flock there every single year to watch people play video games. And they're projecting that this is gonna be one of the largest sources of revenue for the city of Philadelphia, even in comparison to the Eagles and the football team. Uh, that's huge. And you see major sponsors such as Under Armour, Nike, Red Bull, moving their sponsorships from some of these major league teams and sports over to these esports arenas. And that's why you have someone like Ninja. He's one of the most famous gamers in the world. Um, and we're actually gonna have one of his family members here on the show upcoming, which is exciting. Uh, he's sponsored by Red Bull, for example. I mean, 
and he makes tons of money for them because you have millions of people around the world watching him play video games. So, uh, so it's most certainly it's not a niche industry. It's not something that's just off in the peripheries. It's starting to take now center stage, even the sporting world, um, as well as the entertainment world. When it comes to the hopes of this conversation and this ministry, um, you would say like there's kind of a gap in, again, our efforts to evangelize and do ministry in the video game world, right? Yeah, no, most certainly. Um, so there's a gap on multiple levels. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lacuna in the industry um, insofar as just there's an ache within especially the millennial, that's our age group, and the Gen Z soul for deeper philosophical theological dialogue. I'll give an example. Uh, just like Bishop Barron, one of my favorite things to do is go through YouTube and read the comments, right? Um, so whereas Bishop Barron will do that through scientism and sort of the new atheism, I do that with video games. <laughs> so I go through and, and I'll read the comments in YouTube or I'll read through Twitch and see what people are saying about the most recent video games and what they're talking about. Now you'll get your typical superficial comments, oh, this game is awesome, it's so much fun to play. But then you'll get some really sincere things that I think would shock people. Um, I read one comment recently on a soundtrack YouTube video, and it was several paragraphs long mentioning how this soundtrack from this and this video game literally saved this person from committing suicide. Wow. So they were, they were actually contemplating ending their life, and it was them playing this game that reminded them that life was worth living because it had such a profound story plot for them. This experience of the beautiful. Yes. Yes, the experience of the beauty, again, of the depth of the storyline itself, the sense of mission, purpose, adventure, what reinstated their life to have a purpose. Um, and, and once again, those are the kind of things that are taking place in the video game industry that should make our ears perk up as Catholics because that's showing us there's something much deeper going on here than just entertainment. There's an ache in the heart that needs to be satisfied. And right now the gaming industry is doing magnificent with that satisfaction, how are we doing as a church in comparison in this particular field of evangelization? And both men and women play video games. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, my wife plays video games. Yeah. I've seen, again, former students play games. Could you briefly talk about men? Yeah. And yeah. this important demographic for the future of the church, um, how games tap into that longing uh, that ache again to to be a hero, to yeah. be on a quest, yeah. etc. So the largest demographic of gamers is 16 to 35 men. Uh, that is an age group that very much we as a church would like to have fully involved in faith. Mm -hmm. um, it's an age group that you hear constantly about as well in a demographic when you go for, to example for conventions and the Catholic Church, what have you. Um, what is speaking to them? The video game industry is speaking directly to them. Right. And we know right now in our own culture that there's a desperate need to rehabilitate masculinity. And what's happened is because our culture has become anti-masculine in so many ways, mainly through the influence of secular feminism, you have tons of young men, especially those young men who are teens and going into young adulthood, who do not feel like they're able to manifest their masculinity in the real world. So what do they do? They go to make those connections and manifest their masculine virtue in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. That's why they play Call of Duties for eight hours. They have a sense of community, a sense of brotherhood, mission. They get to protect people who are in distress. Mm -hmm. All those masculine virtues that we pride ourselves as Catholic men are present right there in the industry and the industry is tapping into them. And that's why it's so attractive to all these young men. That's why they'll spend the majority of their life and the majority of the hours of their life in their younger years uh, playing these video games. And I want this series to be very, again, finding the the true, the good, and the beautiful in video games. Right. And again, where we as Catholics can affirm that, we will talk about some of the pitfalls, right, some right. of the need to discern what it is you're playing, the prudence in the amount of time given to video games versus other things in your life. So part of the inspiration for the series was in my own life, I've seen the Christian approach to video games either be one where we just don't talk about it, we just kind of ignore it, it's Tetris and Mario, and we just, it's not important enough to talk about, or it's an industry that's demonized outright, right. it's responsible for all the ills of society, there's nothing good about it. And so when it comes to being Christian, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and a, a gamer, it's sometimes like these are the only options, and right, I think right. we can do so much better with approaching, again, the video game industry, um, going into that space for the sake of evangelization as well as to affirm as we would in film or in books like there's good in here that yes. can actually point you to the divine can point you to god yeah absolutely so catholics we always approach the world positively 
not negatively Mm -hmm. because the world in and of itself is good for god so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son the world is is a creature made by a good creator therefore it always has inherent goodness within it as do the activities of humanity made in god's likeness and image when a human being is doing something even if that thing is not necessarily healthy they're doing it because they believe there's a hidden good there Um, and so with video games there's absolutely the same principle there is a good in this culture and that's why it's thriving so much. I mean, I've experienced it myself as a gamer and I continue to be an avid gamer. I know that you do as well. Um, and a lot of these young men and women, as well as older men and women who still play video games, they're not doing so because they have nothing better to do. They're not doing so because they're superficial or like you said, they have no pri- sense of priority or they're demonized. Um, they're doing this because there's goodness that they're recognizing. There's something that's tapping into the deepest recesses of their soul. And this is what's making them now have a sense of living life to the fullest. Mm. And that's not a bad thing, that's a very good thing. Our question is, how can we relate to that? How can we identify that? And also, how can we help mold and shape and form that virtue in order that it might be actualized in the real world? So it's not about dismissing video games wholesale, that's not the answer at all, Um, but rather identifying the positive trends within the industry, identifying the positive moral trends, the theological, philosophical trends, and being able to have now an open dialogue. And that's one of my hopes for this series as well, that it will begin um, a a network of persons, either Catholic, not Catholic, wherever they may come from, uh, but a network of persons who can have deep, honest, philosophical conversations about the the, uh, inner workings of video game culture and what it does to their own hearts as human persons. And you even break down the aspects of community, identity, and mission (laughs) with MMO, RPGs, and FPS. Can you define those and explain how, again, these, these musings of Father Blake. Oh, absolutely. So to all my fellow gamers, I apologize. I have to explain this, you know, for those who may not know what it means. Uh, so I wrote an article several months ago uh, for the Evangelization and Culture Journal. Wonderful. If you have not, you know, subscribed to that journal, I encourage you to do so. Some great stuff in there. Um, but I was asked to do one on video games and culture. And as I've studied the past several years, video game culture in the light of theology and philosophy, I've identified uh, three main areas, if you will, uh, that are most attractive to gamers, that sort of draw gamers into the industry. So you have first MMOs. These are uh, massive multiplayer online games. Something like Fortnite would be an MMO. Uh, These tend to focus highly on community. There's a sense of, as I mentioned before, brotherhood, Mm -hmm. fraternity, Uh, There's a sense of co-oping together to go towards a a common goal. Uh, So these things are essential. We're essentially, we are, we are communal beings made in God's life as an image for the sake of communion. So it makes sense that a communicative activity would be very attractive to us. And that's why I think online gaming is thriving even now. I have an Oculus, uh, which is a virtual reality, you know, headset that's sponsored by Facebook. And uh, one of my favorite games to play is Onward. It's a military co-op game. And uh, you get to play with people all around the world. It's superb. I mean, I love it. I probably spend more time on it than I should, but but, uh, it's that sense of community. So then you have uh, RPGs. These these are role-playing games. And these are more adventure-driven. Skyrim, in particular, is one of my favorite games of all time. Right. Uh, and you get to create your own avatar, which is probably what draws people most into the game. Um, that's why I love RPGs. They're actually my favorite style of games. Uh, and you really get to make this person look to the most minute details, however you would like. And that's incredible. You know. And, and we have an identity crisis right now in our culture. We have men and women all around the world who are struggling with who they are. Mm. But in this gaming world, it's very clear who they are. They're able yeah. to express who they are quite quite uh, avidly. And that's very attractive to people. So that goes with this uh, philosophical desire for identity is what I've correlated to with RPGs. And then finally you have FPSs. These are first person shooters. Call of Duty is probably the most famous one right now. These have to do with mission. When you play an FPS, a first person shooter game, I mean, you are, with a band of brothers or with a band of sisters and you're going on a mission to accomplish a particular goal and we know that as human beings we desire purpose Mm. we are in this world for a reason and if we cannot find reason sitting in a cubicle for nine hours a day then we're going to try to find a reason in this virtual world it's true like in a first person shooter i'm not exploring the world right (laughs) for hours like you would an rpg like with the assassin's creed series i get lost exploring ancient egypt or the age of the Vikings and all this stuff, FPS is like, you get from point A to point B and you have a very clear mission. You're not there to explore. Right. But again, you've got such a wide genre of games that appeal to these. And it's, again, 
the series is going to be asking the deeper questions. Right. What is it underneath? What is drawing us deeper into these genres of video games? Right. And that's something that hasn't really been done before. Um, right now in the industry, there's not anyone talking about those sort of things. So, um, so I think it's very important for us, again, as the church, for us as Christians to begin this deeper conversation on the philosophical, theological ramifications of, of this culture, of which there are many. Um, and a, again, our, our responsibility as Christians is always to identify the good, mm-hmm. to name grace in the world. And there's grace to be named in this industry, and I think that we need to do it. Now, just because a thing exists doesn't mean it's automatically good. This right. is where I, you know, a caveat would be some discernment towards the types of media and movies and stories and video games that we play, we allow into our souls, that we allow into our households, especially for us as fathers. Like, I don't just allow any film into my right. house. And so not wanting to vilify video games or just ignore them, but find the good in them while also looking at not every game is necessarily good Correct. for me to play morally um, or age appropriate. Right. You know, I'm not going to show Gladiator to my three-year-old. <laughs> like, that comes later. <laughs> I'm not going to play Resident Evil with my three-year-old. We, we can shoot zombies together when he's older. Right. Uh, and so some of that is discernment and prudence there. Um, so especially as any parents listening, um, you, it's good to ask these questions. Yeah, yeah. There are two main groups of people that have responded to my articles with the Word on Fire blog and the journal. One, the largest group are gamers. Mm. You know, some millennial and Gen Z gamers who are just saying thank you. Thank you for starting this conversation. We want more of it. The second largest group that I hear from are parents of millennials or Gen Z or millennial parents who right. now have Gen Z children. And they're wondering, Father Blake, how do I address this topic? Again, my 16-year-old, all he wants to do is play Fortnite all, all day long. What do I do? Do I take it away? Do I punish him? Um, is this video game okay for him to play? Is it not for you know not for him to play uh, morally? What what is in this game? Uh, so these are the kind of topics I think that we need to discuss as well and to to really actively talk about uh, would be how can we discern that you're right? Just like movies, just like books, just like any other form of entertainment, there's a such thing as a bad video game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there are things that you shouldn't be exposing your soul to. At the same time, are we able to identify the good things and to foster those within our home and, and to age people into them in, in an active way? Video games are not going anywhere. Right. So it's either we learn how to parent our children into a healthy appreciation of them, or we let the world form their appreciation of them, and that won't go as well. Right. So before we conclude this first episode, can we talk a little bit about beauty? Because, <laughs> because that's something that is so core to Bishop Barron's project of leading with beauty. Right. The, the modern world right now, truth and goodness, to, to, to start the conversation of evangelization with what is true, what you have to believe, or what is, what is the good, how you should act, mm-hmm. tends to get brushed off. We put a wall up. Don't tell me how to live. But the beautiful is something that pierces the heart. It's something yeah. that says, hey, look at this. Yeah. Look at the beauty of this thing. Yeah. This artwork, this music, this game. And then where does that beauty come from? Mm-hmm. It's not an end in itself. It's pointing me to something. So beauty in video games. Yeah. Again, they've come a long way from <laughs> 8-bit to 16-bit to 64-bits to the games of today. Right. In terms of, again, graphics and music and, and the whole shebang. Can you can we talk a little bit, bit about that before this episode is up? Yeah, so that's a theme I think will be uh, strewn throughout our entire series because if I could name one thing that the video game industry has capitalized on amazingly, it would be the transcendental beauty. Mm-hmm. It, it really is astonishing. Um, and that, I personally believe, is the most attractive thing right now about video games to the majority of gamers. Um, it's beyond just the entertainment value. It's the fact that they're now being drawn into a world that is seemingly transcendent. I mean, if you play something like Assassin's Creed or Skyrim, you're starting to recognize amazing uh, aptitudes of beauty and goodness within these games. For example, Skyrim. You're in a magical realm called Tamriel, a sort of medieval-style game. Sweeping landscapes, as far as I can see, rolling hills, mountains, put in the background this amazing soundtrack, combine that now with an epic story plot, an epic line of, of summarization of virtue and of goodness and of conquering and mission. And before you know it, you have this beautiful project mm-hmm. that is highly attractive, that engrosses your senses, 
I mean, all of it. The only thing that you're missing is, you know, smell. <laughs> yeah. All the other senses, even especially now even with the Oculus, you get to utilize all your sensory capacities. Um, so all your other senses are just on high alert when you're playing these games and they're being exposed to beautiful, magnificent things. So, um, so that is, again, in my opinion, the most powerful gift right now that the video game industry is capitalizing on. So when it comes to, again, for the sake of, of leading people to the gospel, I think it's important to to look at the industry and the advances that have happened and not outright demonize it and not right. outright wag a finger at the amount of hours you spend because again, you lose yourself in something you enjoy. You mm -hmm. lose yourself in good company or when you're immersed in beauty. So one hour becomes three or five hours very easily. Yeah. <laughs> and again, prudence and knowing again, what are the first responsibilities in my life? You know, as a father, I can't game the amount of time I used to. Right. At the same time as Catholics who have an incarnational faith that's tangible, it's real, I need to go before the real presence, you know, physically. Yes. And live it in the world. There's a time to turn the console off. Um, there's a time to take kind of these these principles and live it in the world. Uh, just closing thoughts on that. Yeah, that's where I could see video games uh almost being like stories. So yeah. when I was growing up, my dad used to always tell me stories for bedtime. You know, my favorite character was Karate Joe. This was a character that my dad made up and Karate Joe would go on adventures and he would go beat up pirates and one day he was beating up zombies or whatever the story was. But what my father was doing was not just tickling my imagination, in the end, he was forming virtue with them. You know, I admired Karate Joe, his bravery, his ability to go out to fight, to rescue this princess or what have you. Video games are doing the same thing nowadays, many of them, not all of them, but many of them. They're giving, especially young men, the sense of virtuous purpose, that now I'm, I, I have a mission, I, I have to protect this village, I have to save this princess, I have to, to do this activity to save the world, and it's forming virtue within them. Now the trick's going to be, how do we transmit that virtue, that ideal, into the real world? That's where I think that we as the church can thrive. Because there is a beautiful world out there right. that's even more amazing than the virtual world. There is a life that's worth, that's worth living. You were created to be a saint, and Jesus Christ loves you. And that is real, right. not just something that exists in a video game. And if we could find a way to bridge that gap, between the goodness and the virtue that young people are finding right now in the video game industry to bring it now into the real world will raise an entire generation of saints. I am utterly convinced of that. Yeah, amen. And so, again, thank you for, for watching this first episode. We're excited that, again, this is a series. We're going to be interviewing some really awesome people yeah. who are in the industry or doing some great things for evangelization through video games. And so... Father Blake, any last thoughts? Yeah, I would just encourage the, the audience, please tune in for all of the other videos because we have some outstanding people coming in to be interviewed. I mean, God has really lined up <laughs> some amazing people from the industry that I know you and I are absolutely ecstatic about. Um, and so continue tuning in. We're excited to have you all with us. This is going to be a great series, and I think it's going to tap into something really profound for the future of evangelization of the church. So thank you so much for joining us. Yep. God bless and game on. 